There you are, Dr. Hello. Stevenson. How are you? I'm so good right. to see you. Thank you. You too. Talk about not knowing how to do social. You mentioned the other day. I'm like, what button do I push? Oh, so. no. It's all right. Well, we're here now. We're here now. And uh, I'm, I'm so excited to talk with you. I'm so excited to talk about the retreat. I'm so excited to talk about this article. And I think really we should start with the article. The, the retreat is like the, 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 the sugar, you know, it's like the frosting on the cake. That's right. Um, but I think that, you know, it was really uh, quite amazing that this article came out when it did. It has been a long time coming. There have been a lot of articles in the past year or so about menopause, almost treating it like it's a fad. And this was the first article that I felt really um, addressed the issues that women are facing and why menopause is sort of a black hole when it comes to information. Um, so let's talk a little bit about it. Um, you know, one of the things that I thought was really significant, you and I both saw the Wild sort of, uh, uh, Wild company did like a, a synopsis of the article. And some of the things that they were talking about I thought were quite interesting. The major one being that this is literally about the fact that women's suffering does not matter, right? That the idea that women could go through physical and emotional pain uh, just doesn't seem to matter when it comes yeah. to menopause. I was so happy this, this article came out too. And I, honestly, I think that it, uh, it was beautifully written and incredibly complex. And I'm so grateful that several people broke it down because for myself even, it was really long. I mean, so much information. Even even that being said, only a fraction of what there is to talk about was covered because there is so much to talk about. But I think it was a fantastic start to the conversation. Mm. I absolutely loved the beginning of the article, the, the idea that if men had anything like this, there's not a chance that they would be suffering. I mean, it, it's just so obvious that, you know, that we're not equal yet. But I uh, absolutely loved most of the pieces of the article and there's so many parts we can talk about just I'd be really interested to hear what your listeners want to hear about because that you and I could I could literally talk to you for a week um, about yeah hormones, well so. you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna start with some of the things that I yeah. thought were were really impressive because uh, guys if you haven't read the article I will put a link to it in my bio it is uh, it is an essential piece of reading and really I think uh, Susan you sort of hit the nail on the head this is the most nuanced article that we've had about healthcare and menopause. And I think the thing that struck me most is uh, how we, you know, this whole kind of medical issue and stage of life has been ignored, that there's been no, not one single randomized trial for hormone therapy for women in perimenopause, not one trial. We have no Same. clinical data. And that to me seems absolutely insane. So when you get to this stage of life, which is us Gen Xers right now, we have been forced to figure out how to deal with this on our own. That um, Sue Dominus talks about this in the article, that so many of her friends in uh, their 50s started to feel all sorts of different things, hot flashes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, low libido, all of these things. And they were asking doctors for help. But because there was a study done in 2002 that was really truly misunderstood, Hormones like estrogen, uh, replacement hormones in uh, menopause were vilified and made to sound so dangerous that even doctors who could prescribe them stopped prescribing them. And in some cases, there are doctors who are under 50 who really would never have learned about menopause or how to treat menopause because the medical establishment has said that hormones were, were bad for everybody. Yeah, it was, it's, it was such a disaster. You know, I, I love Peter Atia. He has a great podcast about health and wellness. And he described the WHI as the worst piece of research ever done in history, which I kind of agree. It was just such a, forgive my language, a, a shit show. Um, <laughs> and I, I love what the physician who was interviewed said she remembered where she was when it came out. And I have the same experience. I was a young physician. I know exactly where I was when it came out. And to us, it was unbelievable because for years we had known, like we, we'd known in our bones that estrogen was good and we were prescribing it really like candy. We were telling women, you, you need to take estrogen. It's Now we still believe this now, it's a come sort of full circle that it's good for your bones, that it probably reduces your risk of heart disease and Alzheimer's and sexual function, not to mention it gets rid of all of those awful symptoms. So it was something that was so shocking to hear. Now I had been in practice prior to the WHI and so I continued prescribing hormones and there was an interesting observation that older doctors and I'm 55, so in that category, 
haven't been so indoctrinated with that nonsense because they like you said that younger doctors never had the experience of seeing the benefit of hormones they were just told that or they weren't told anything I guess. they weren't told anything i mean no, this I article mean, with no education yeah. so so uh, your listeners might uh, expect you go to your gynecologist and think that this is going to be the person who knows about menopause and, and they don't know anything i mean i uh, I found that actually totally shocking that since, um, you know, that when we talk about the WHI, we're talking about a study that, again, vilified these hormones, told people that they were unhealthy, that women should not take them um, for fear of stroke or heart attack or breast cancer, if I understand correctly. And I want to get back to that for uh, in a moment about the risk benefits of this that right. I, that wasn't talked so much about in the article, but I think that we should address. Um, but that if you... you if you started practicing after this, uh, this study came out, since there was no way to treat menopause, people stopped talking about it. I heard that there was about two hours of, medical tra of menopause training in medical school. In some cases, there wasn't any. Because I don't remember any. Yeah, I, I don't remember any. I really don't. Right. I think I, I remember being taught something about just the physiology of you stop ovulating. It was sort of more like this happens period that's it this is what happens and that's it there wasn't anything else said about it except in those days we prescribed primer and like candy to everybody and that for your listeners is an awful product that's made from horse urine but at the time that was all we had and it did really relieve symptoms and and that's the drug that was used in the women's health initiative study you know what's interesting that i think in, in there's so many things about this really great article and in my opinion didn't get into enough detail about the fact that all of these risks that are still talked about are based on a study that was using drugs that we do not use anymore and based on an age group and health risk profile of women that does not represent people like you and I. Uh, average age was 63, very unhealthy patient group because they actually wanted to see deaths in the study. It's awful how studies are designed, but that was a they, they wanted to see deaths because that's measurable. And so they picked older women who were very unhealthy, hoping that that would happen. And understandably, that, that's not you and I. That's not relevant to a healthy 50-year-old or healthy 48-year-old. It's a totally different subset of patients. So it's a different drugs that we don't use anymore. And a patient population that is not representative of the people who are listening to this right now. Which is so crazy, right? I mean, so crazy, this is irrelevant, right? Yeah, and then, this is and then they made blanket statements of, that apply to everybody based on this very small group that isn't really you and I and drugs that we don't use anymore. So I, 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 I wish she had maybe talked a little bit more about that because all of these statements and some of them are very confusing, like um, so many are confusing. Oh, it's so good news. It says in the article in North American Menopause Society says it's safe to take hormones for the majority of patients up until age 60, for example, and, and you'll hear statements like that. That's a, there's so much wrong with that statement. Right. It's not that you can't take it when you're over 60. It's that ideally you start it before you've been postmenopausal for 10 years. And I said, so many nuances, but someone might read that article, including a physician and say, oh, well, I, I need to make people stop taking their hormones when they're 60, which is nonsense like we want that's when we start getting osteoporosis and alzheimer's and other <laughs> we, we absolutely want to continue it you know for life but well, ideally start it earlier so there's some some of those things are so confusing because we're talking about different different products now that we use that are much safer in, in a population that's not that group that was in the whi i mean totally yeah. different I mean, okay, so just to, to be clear, I mean, this article definitely didn't cover everything. But it was but great. I, yeah. I think, I think yeah. what was so great about it was that it was the first article to really look at the fact that uh, women's health, mental and physical, has been completely ignored at this right. stage of life. And right. that we have vilified hormones in a way that has made eight out of 10 women afraid to take hormones when chances are those hormones could be the most beneficial thing for them. And before Absolutely. we get into... Yeah all of the other things, right? The big issue, we were talking about hormones that we don't use anymore. They used a population that doesn't make sense for the study. It really is terrifying sort of how you can manipulate data Absolutely. to say whatever you want, right? right. So this is, and, and somebody's asking a great question, how do we ensure and promote new studies? Well, we have to put clinical dollars, clinical research dollars towards 
tests for perimenopausal women in order to find out what works best in the right age range. Now, really, as, as Dr. Susan is saying, she was before that test. She was practicing before that, that um, study came out. And so she understood, obviously, the benefits of estrogen, particularly estrogen and progesterone, um, that benefit women going through menopause. Now, the one thing that I think really scared people, right, the big thing that I remember was that you can't go on hormones because you're going to get breast cancer. Right. One right. out of eight women is going to get breast cancer. Now, is that directly related to estrogen or just is that the stat in general? Yeah. So that has nothing to do with estrogen. So in the United States, our lifetime risk is approximately one in eight, you know, different, different risks for different people based on their family history and so on. But that's sort of a general number that's often discussed. But uh, for an individual patient, say from 50 to 60, our risk per year is minuscule. And so if you read a statistic, they actually describe this pretty well. If you read something like breast cancer risk was increased by 20%, that is actually a very tiny number in, in real patients. And actually, even that, and I'm, even that was on these awful drugs that we don't use anymore. And she mentioned somewhere in the middle of a paragraph, I wish it had been highlighted that the group of women who were taking estrogen without the awful, nasty progestin lookalike chemical, Provera, had no increased risk in breast cancer. Actually, they had a decreased incidence of breast cancer, and that was hidden in the paragraph somewhere. So all of this, uh, there was some other statements about how when you've been taking estrogen for five years or more, your breast cancer risk goes up. That's not accurate. That's if you take Premarin and Provera for five years or more. Nobody takes that anymore. So when you're taking bioidentical estradiol and progesterone, we don't see any increased risk in breast cancer, nor did they see any with Premarin, which is an awful drug, but even that didn't cause an increased risk in breast cancer. So, And, and, think, and with no estrogen, right, when right. you're going through menopause, aside from yeah. the annoying hot flashes, night sweats, brain fog, you know, insomnia, which are just some of the really difficult, I mean, you know, com like annoying symptoms, but certainly there are even more, you know, and she talks about this in the article, more significant symptoms like depression, anxiety, uh, low libido, things that really interfere with your daily life. Mm -hmm. That's with no estrogen. Yeah. So, well, you know, Most I'm patients wondering- who get breast cancer did not take right. estrogen. So they, the average patient with breast cancer never took estrogen. And the great majority of patients who take estrogen never get breast cancer. It's a common disease. So you're going to see it occasionally happen in the pa a patient who's taking hormones or eats ice cream or whatever drives a Ferrari. It doesn't mean that they're <laughs> causative, right? It just because right. the two things happen at the same time. Now, I so, want to talk about the benefits, yeah. right, of estrogen just for a second, because um, that's, what, that's where I see that, that this whole risk right. benefit thing, even if there was this 20% chance of, a, of, you know, of breast cancer. Yeah, but that, there isn't. But yeah, I'll but, play devil's advocate. There's okay, not. But play yes, devil's advocate. If, so right. there isn't. But yeah. the benefits of post of estrogen for postmenopausal people, that's where I think we really need to start looking at what's important. Cardiac health, cognitive yeah. health, bone health, right. right? Osteoporosis can be completely avoided if we are taking estrogen, or, or it can certainly make it much better. Yeah, so I... I, I I absolutely love that um, Abram Blum was quoted in this article. He, he co-wrote a book called Estrogen Matters that I think is so important for people to read if they've still got concerns about estrogen. And he really goes through this whole, how did this happen that estrogen got vilified? And, and it very cl you know, clearly lays out the science behind the, all of those things things that we're talking about. And one of them, and again, I, I don't in any way want to suggest that breast cancer isn't a very important and very scary disease. But none of the studies, even, even those that suggested there was an increased risk in breast cancer, none of them have ever shown that we die from it. And I'm not suggesting that getting breast cancer and surviving it is a good thing. But we, we don't course. die, you know, if, if we're not going to die from breast cancer these days, fingers crossed, if we get regular follow-up. Now, we might get breast cancer, and it's caught very early, whether or not we take hormones, and generally we'll be fine more than 95% of the time. Again, being very careful not to downplay how significant that is for patients who have it very scary. And However, I, I love that Dr. Bloom really highlights this fact that the, the height of fear about breast cancer has really become disproportionate to the fear that we should have about things like osteoporosis and heart disease and depression and obesity and diabetes and arguably more important things 
but we've, we've over played our fear around breast cancer. And I, I, I'm not, again, I want to be very sensitive in saying of that. Of course. We don't want it. And grant, I don't want breast cancer, but I screen for it regularly. If I get it, I'll be fine. But I really don't want to break my hip and end up in a wheelchair. And actually, our risk of dying from an osteoporosis-related injury is about the same as our risk of dying from breast cancer. But people don't, there's not such an emotional fear of osteoporosis-related injuries, for example, or heart disease. And, and look, and, and I think, look, one of the things that we need to talk about, and, and you and I have had these conversations before about, you know, there are different hormones that have different mechanisms for delivery. Some are FDA approved, some are not. You really do have to see your yeah. doctor in order to find out what's right for you. But what I found really significant about this article, it was finally a vindication that mm -hmm. these hormones can be helpful to people in menopause. And yet we still have doctors who are either just so ignorant they they don't know anything about menopause or you know she talks about the fact that 15 minutes with your doctor is simply not enough time to even ask the right questions to even know whether or not your depression is something you should ask your doctor about or joint pain is something that you should mention right so how do we advocate for ourselves because this is what i think is so important not everybody who is going to their gynecologist or their gp knows what to say when you're in your mid 40s, late 40s, when you can start perimenopause, we may not know what those symptoms look like. It may not be hot flashes at first. It may not be um, insomnia at first. It can be you know, dry skin and depression. How do we start to advocate for ourselves in a way that, that makes sense to somebody who has 12 minutes in a doctor's office? It's, it's but it just it drives me crazy that we even have to ask women to do that, right? I mean, so yeah. first of all, I just want to be mad about the fact that we're even coming up with a scenario for how to do that, because it's not your job, that your doctor's job is to get those questions out of you. So in my office, you have a questionnaire and we ask every single question because perhaps you haven't thought about joint pain or depression, vaginal dryness or all the things, right? So it's a long list. Right. Uh, so, um, <laughs> In, in light of the fact that your doctor might not present you with a list like that, uh, maybe you should make your own list. I mean, it's a, it's a tragedy that we have to do that, but go to your doctor with a list written down. I mean, perhaps it's sad that we have to do that, but in, in, well, in the current community, I think we do have to do that. Yeah, so, and I I think, you know, one of the things I was going to say is um, there are a lot of people that are coming out with menopause trackers and mm -hmm. that is um, perhaps something that, you know, apps or even just the idea that I've heard doctors say, just start noting differences right. in your behavior, your health, things that did not just sort of appeared out of nowhere, but, um, and bring those to your doctor, right? Start there and maybe get through, start with the, the top thing that is most kind of uh, uh, difficult or interfering with the quality of your daily life and rate them all the way down to the smallest, most annoying thing. Um, so only if you get to the top two with your doctor, your doctor may be able to say, ah, okay, this is menopause. Now, what I also found really interesting in this article is that one doctor was saying she wouldn't prescribe hormones unless there were significant <laughs> symptoms, right? Because some symptoms are just normal aging. Right. What in the, what is a significant symptom and who gets to decide? Right. And what does normal aging mean? I mean, menopause is not normal aging. Menopause is a particular phase of aging. Yeah. It's infuriating. And um, I, I, you know, I, I'm so glad I'm a doctor because I, able I am to, too. I, yeah. I, I mean, I have resources so I could get myself treated. When I was going through menopause, I thought, I mean, I was suicidal for some days. I mean, I won't, I, it, it, I just felt so terrible. I couldn't sleep. My moods were horrible. I didn't want to live 40 more years or 50 more years. I felt terrible. And I was able to get resources to make myself feel better. And the idea that most women have to stay in that state just makes me sick. And that, but if you've got 10 minutes, let's just assume that you're seeing a doctor in traditional medicine, you, you really are going to have to advocate for yourself. And you might have to see more than one person, which is tragic, but, but true. Uh, the North American Menopause Society website is a good resource. And I, I've t told mentioned this to your listeners before not everybody who's listed there knows anything about menopause because to join you just pay a 
fee, <laughs> there is a higher level of North American Menopause Society practitioner that, that is somebody who has a bit more education. So it, it's very sad that people have to do this, but and I think in this day and age, until we get a little bit more advanced, we have to advocate for ourselves. So write down your symptoms and I, we kind of have to demand what we want. And I think this is so, I mean, you have to lie. It's not funny. It's funny in a tragic sort of way that a physician's more than happy to prescribe you any number of drugs that will cause a, a, all kinds of right? You know, when you watch TV ads and it's like, okay, this drug, by the way, might cause death, blindness, da, 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 <laughs> small. They'll, they'll write a prescription for that, but they'll tell you you can't take uh, hormones that have been produced in your body your whole life. I mean, it just makes absolutely no sense. So, and I think it's, um, it's also it's also kind of interesting because I, I find that, you know, when I, I did uh, really experience extreme depression um and i was you know thrown antidepressants i was thrown anti-anxiety medication nobody even suggested to me that it was potentially menopause and that there was another way to treat menopause instead of depression or anxiety so yeah. mental health i think plays a huge issue here when we're talking about hormones and what they're able to do yeah. and so when you you know at, at, at all of these people who are asking questions and there are so many thank you guys i'm sorry if we can't answer all of them uh i you know leave them on this live i'm going to have it up on my igtv and um dr susan absolutely yeah. will take yeah, a look at them look. um but i think you know there are a couple of things, right? One, we need to be paying attention to our health. We need to know that there are other reasons or other resources aside from, um, you know, the five minute, oh, you're depressed, let me put you on, you know, uh, I don't know, Prozac. Um, and that there are other, you know, there, there are other causes for these feelings, not just physical symptoms. And, you know, look, that's not to say, obviously, that, um, that hormones are for everybody, but the idea that we have really disallowed that as an option for most people, and especially, um, you know, uh, Sue Dominus talks about women who have had childhood trauma, particularly differences in race, black women in particular, have much more severe symptoms and are absolutely dismissed when it comes to what these symptoms are. I don't know how this happened, but I think it's curious. If you were an alien looking from out of space, we live in a country where you're pretty much allowed to do anything you want. And I live in Texas. You can carry a gun in your purse. <laughs> you can ride a motorcycle without a helmet. You can smoke cigarettes in many places. But doctors are telling you you cannot take hormones. I mean, I, I'm not my job is not to tell you what you can or cannot do. That is not my job. My job is to educate and then you make your own choice. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense that a doctor would tell you you cannot take hormones. I can, I can understand they might share the pros and cons with you or their particular opinion. But, but isn't that great? Their opinion I mean, doesn't matter. It's exactly. whatever you want. Right? Exactly. I mean, we are autonomous in that way. It's 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 one one of the reasons that we wanted to do this live tonight, mm -hmm. right? It's that one get the word out. This article, I think, is really a, a pivotal moment mm -hmm. in what we are doing for people that are experiencing menopause and how to be helpful. But also, you are so good at breaking this down. And we did another live where you really um, made so much sense about the differences between natural and synthetic bioidentical. So again, guys, really follow Dr. Susan and ask her questions because she is so good at um, elucidating this information. And it is complicated and it is nuanced, but this feels to me like the start of something really big. And not just in terms of being able to take hormones, like you're saying, you're giving us that option. You're giving right. us that information. We also know there are great naturopathic mm -hmm. options for people who legitimately can't take hormones or don't want to. But the idea that we have a medical community that is not educated us that is does not care about this kind of suffering is unacceptable yeah, I totally agree and I, I think it's it, this this article is going to be so useful for so many thousands of women to even take it to their physician just to give them some language around the questions to us so it is a it is a really great start I, I did want to mention something there was a time you know I don't know let's just say a few years ago when it wasn't quite so clear that hormones are safe Mm -hmm. You know, that's become more and more clear as years have gone on. And I can tell you, I was felt very strongly, and many of my patients would too, that I would have said, had it truly been an issue, that 
I might have gotten breast cancer. I would have said, I don't care. I'll, I'll t I give it to me anyway. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling so bad. If my br breast cancer risk goes up slightly, or frankly, my risk of anything else, I don't care. Give me the hormones. And that would have been my choice. And I would have been an educated person making an educated decision about the risks and benefits for my own body. Now, it turns out, well, I don't have to worry about that because that risk isn't there. But the idea that we would tell someone, you cannot take this because there might be an increased risk of this, that, and the other. How does that fit in with our idea of independence and freedom? Like the, the proper conversation, in my opinion, would be, here are the risks and benefits. What would you like to do? You know, to say you cannot do it. And like you said, the, these doctors will freely prescribe you antidepressants, sleeping pills. You, could, you can get a prescription for hydrocodone or oxycodone more easily than you could get estrogen for many doctors. If you walked in and said you had a migraine, you'd get narcotics. Mm. But you can't get, I mean, it just makes no sense. And so, it drives, you know, obviously, I get emotional about this because it, it's it's not a small thing. Um, and this article really pointed to that too, that this kind of comedy meme thing about the lady with hot flashes, like it's just that, you know, it's just, oh, it's just a hormonal, you know, just she's on her period or whatever. Right, she's hysterical. Right, right. I mean, we, we, get, we get a lot of that. Right, yeah. Right? Oh, As women, we just, just get a lot of that. It. She's just hormonal right now, whatever. It, it It's so dismissive. This is a real problem for many women and certainly there's a small percentage of women who go through menopause without that degree of symptoms but it's not a it, it's not a small thing no uh, and it's life changing also i just can't believe that this is a stage of life that we we are so i think you know the the other piece of this right is that menopause feels like the gateway to midlife right to middle age which so many of us are sort of you know able to avoid because we have all these cosmetic procedures that make us look so much younger than we are. But physiologically, if we want to be at our best, then we need to be thinking about menopause as part of that, admitting to being in menopause, admitting to being in midlife doesn't mean that you can't look great, but we, we somehow vilify aging in our society, right? I mean, this is a patriarchal lens. Like, you know, the male gaze totally. does not want to, uh, you know, look on women who are aging. And I think that's a bunch of bullshit. I think the that, you know, when we think about menopause, it's sort of like, how do we, in some ways, I think we started this conversation here because it felt like an easy way to talk about things that are even bigger than menopause, right? The, all of the situational stressors and anxieties that may happen in midlife. And we need tools to deal with that if we're not even talking about it, just because we're still getting our period or because we have Botox and we look 30. You know, these are not things that matter if we don't feel good. Do you agree? Right. Oh, completely. Uh, I, you know, being someone, I, I you know, I was a doctor way before I went through menopause, and I admit I was in that same group. I, I wasn't educated. The number of pieces of stupid information that I gave people and probably very dismissive advice I feel guilty for now in retrospect. But, you know, there's nothing like going through it yourself or understanding what it's like. I have a completely different perspective now being 55 than I did when I was 40. So it I can't say this will always work, but if you're looking for a physician, maybe find someone who is a female who's in this age group. Not only will they possibly have been through this themselves and have some empathy for the situation from a personal point of view, but they also probably practiced before 2002. And so there was tons of very good science saying that heart disease was reduced mm -hmm. before. The and heart disease is the number one killer right. of women, if I'm not and mistaken. So, right. So that this whole nonsense that developed worrying about heart disease being increased by hormones is just wrong and so like we, we knew that before 2002 we know that now uh, so you know some of this stuff like unfortunately there's an education gap for physicians and so you know maybe somebody who's who practiced a little a bit before 2002. I was a baby doctor in 2000. I mean, I was, I had only been practicing for three years, but I, I had been indoctrinated with 
the idea that hormones were good. Yeah. And so, and, and my hope is that never let go of that idea. Now <laughs> are are going right. to start getting the education that they right. need to have because this whole article really was just about the fact that women are not getting the care that they need at this stage right. of life, and that that is just overwhelming, right? Whether you you are seeing a doctor who knows something about hormones or you're seeing a doctor who doesn't, the idea that we are ignoring this situation, exactly, somebody is saying this should be a standard across the board, whether you choose to take hormones or not, that your doctor knows enough to tell you what your options are. And, and we have been denied that. So again, this is just another example of gender inequity that I think is, I mean, this has gone on for too long. And unfortunately, just like you, I suffered without knowing what was happening to me. And that's the other thing. Because I knew nothing about menopause, I wound up um, attributing all of these symptoms to other things. So yeah. I just thought, oh, I'm depressed. Oh, I'm anxious. I don't know why. I don't know why my skin is so dry. I don't know why I feel this way. And it was, you know, I could dismiss any single symptom on its own. So, you know, one thing I do tell people, you know, definitely, as I said, follow Dr. Susan, check out her website. Electra Health has done a really great service in creating the 21st Century Guide to Menopause that at least shows you the 34 common symptoms that you may experience in menopause. So you can start paying attention yourself because as I said, we are, this article is the beginning. We are not, um, we are not at the point where we have doctors where we need to be or the medical community where we need it to be. And uh, for ourselves and to be proactive, learn as much information as you can from trusted sources. There is a lot of information across the internet. Not everything is right. So you really need to um, you know, get second opinions and make sure that what you're doing is right for you. I think that's incredibly important. I I couldn't agree more. I mean, honestly, the, there's so many things that don't make sense in medicine. There are too many to count. There, there are countless things that you can buy across the counter that are way more dangerous than any purported risk of hormone replacement. I'm actually hoping in the future we can get birth control pills and hormone replacement over the counter. I mean, it, it's there's so many health benefits. And having to go through the gateway of multiple physicians who don't know what they're talking about to get to something that you probably know more about than they do at this point, if you've listened to this conversation, yeah, more exactly. than the gynecologist, it, it drives me crazy to think that most people have to do that. And I was so lucky I didn't, I could write myself a prescription, but I mean, I cannot even imagine what it would be like if I were feeling the way that I did and have somebody turn me away. Oh, I might not yeah. still be living. Honestly, I was so distraught with my own symptoms and that this is not an uncommon thing. Um, and I feel great now, by the way, and I'm just taking a basic hormone replacement. And, I, and you I look feel, great and you run marathons. I, I feel and you, you're good. I, I've you, got great sex drive. I have good energy. I'm not depressed. I sleep for eight hours a night. I mean, it's, it's not magic. And this is something that anybody should have access to. And also, I just love the fact that like, what I mean, this is not a privilege that you're talking about no. these, these things being able to sleep, right, or, you know, being able to feel good should not, it's not a privilege, it's a right. And that's Absolutely. the thing that I think upsets me the most. We keep getting one question is, how old is too old to start HRT? Yeah, so, so uh, um, I alluded to that a little bit. So there's, there's all these numbers that have been thrown around that are all different derivatives from information from the Women's Health Initiative study. So, so commonly we'll hear that we ideally want to start taking hormones within the first 10 years of menopause. So people talk about a 10 year estrogen window. That does not mean that you cannot take hormones after 10 years, but ideally I think about it like putting money in the bank. It, it would be great if you started saving when you're 20, but just because you didn't, it doesn't mean you shouldn't start when you're 40, right? So you get more benefit if you start it earlier. So the ideal situation is to start on hormone replacement within the first, hopefully, few months of mm. menopause, but certainly within the first five to 10 years. So unfortunately, because of that information, statements have evolved like you can't take it when you're over 60. Uh, that's a made up number that came from this idea that the mo the benefit is greatest when we started within the first 10 years. And there's an assumption that you were 50 when you went through menopause, so you can't take it when you're over 60. That's this, this is all made up and it's all based on women's health initiative data using drugs we don't use anymore in unhealthy patients. 
So if you come into my office and you're 68 and you have not taken hormones and you're healthy and you're active and your heart's in good shape and everything else doesn't seem to put you at any additional risk, I would start you on hormones if that was your choice. Of course, we discuss the pros and cons. Right. And so and also, there's sorry, no one other thing that, yeah, that there's you no bring black up. And white answer. Uh, so mm -hmm. if a doctor says, okay, you, you're 59 and a half, you need to stop your hormones when you're 60. I just, I would say, what, show me the data that supports that statement. There isn't any. Um, now, well, there's no data. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is one of the things that like drives me crazy. We're, we're talking about a 2002 study that vilified hormones right. that was completely misread right. and completely misunderstood using the wrong population altogether. Yeah. And so it is very hard, I think, to make these choices without speaking to a doctor and, and really maybe, you know, even getting a second opinion because mm -hmm. we don't have a lot of data around that. Right. Um, the one thing that I was also going to ask, and uh, of course, my brain fog, I completely forgot yeah. it, but um, just the, the idea that if we are concerned, right, about what is going on with us, and we have certain characteristics that could be menopause, do you... Um, do you recommend like sort of ruling out anything else? Like I hear a lot of times that people have problems with their thyroid, right? Mm -hmm. Is that something that you would check before putting somebody on hormones? Would you check and see, you know, like in, it, to me, what I'm concerned about is the fact that like it's a cluster of symptoms that really make up menopause. And if you understand that they are connected, it makes it a lot easier to say, we're going to put you on hormones. But if you mm -hmm. only have a few of them, or if there is something else that could be causing these issues, do you look for that first? Yes. So if, in a perfect world, it, which it is not. Okay. So in a perfect world, if everybody <laughs> had not. access to a menopause specialist who could spend an hour with you, so let's just pretend. Which, which you do. Right. So then you would come to my office and we would have your big long menopause questionnaire that you wouldn't have to give me because I would give it to you. And then we would talk about all of that. And then we would do an extensive panel of blood work, not just checking your ovarian hormones, but your thyroid, as you mentioned, we check for nutritional deficiencies, insulin resistance, cortisol, a bunch of things that could be affecting your symptoms because you know, maybe you're going through menopause and maybe you're also pre-diabetic and maybe you also have low thyroid and vitamin D deficiency. And maybe all of that is combining into making you feel terrible. So I, I, I love that there's access to these online programs like Alloy because that's a whole lot better than nothing. One of the things that is missing there is it doesn't have, you don't have the opportunity to have that in-depth analysis, but hey, it's a, I don't want to throw out the, the, the baby to be with the bad one. Right, right, <laughs> right, exactly. Right, and, and so, guys, you, um, you'll, if you read this article in the New York Times again by Sue Dominus, the, the three uh, companies that they talk about the most are Alloy, uh, Evernown, and Midi Health, which are all telehealth companies for hormones. Um, and again, if that is what you can afford and that's what you have access to, that is better than nothing. Um, Dr. Susan, uh, spending an hour with Dr. Susan is not cheap, not gonna lie, right? But these are the things that for now are available to us. And it is making use of them and having as much knowledge to advocate for yourself as possible before you go to any telehealth company or any doctor. That's really essential. And um, the other thing that I wanted to ask because I've heard this before is, let's say you have already determined, right? What I like is that you're not talking about a hormone test, hormone panel test, yeah. you're talking about all the other things that could affect somebody at the menopausal stage, mm -hmm. right? Because we know now, I've heard this from several doctors, you treat symptoms. You do not have to take hormone levels. You do not have to see where somebody's estrogen is at to be understand that they could be perimenopausal and treat those symptoms. Oh, absolutely. So uh, the checking blood work is uh, a luxury. Uh, but you can listen to a patient. This is why those online uh, type of groups can be very effective. Uh, because if you're 49 and you have not had a period for four months and you're having hot flashes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, you can't sleep and you're depressed, I know your estrogen is <laughs> going to be zero. I don't need the blood test to tell me that. And your progesterone is right. going to be zero and your testosterone will be close to that too. So replacing it without blood work is, is you know, going back to just doctors using their clinical judgment, we don't necessarily need a test. Um, but if you have an opportunity to do testing, you can check for a lot of other things because there are some other really common processes that start happening.
happening as we get older. Like one of the most common complaints that, that I had and many people have is that getting fat around the middle, for example. Yes. Now that could be just menopause or it could be prediabetes or it could be the cortisol's high or some other things. And so, you know, if we have an opportunity to, to do some more holistic detective work, great. But and don't, again, don't, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Right. If you could right. go to Walgreens and get an estrogen patch and take some progesterone, I would just say, go do that. I mean, that's a lot better than nothing. Unfortunately, you can't. You have to go through a doctor, which is super annoying. But if you can do it uh, through telehealth, great. And if you've got the resources to see someone and get a little bit more holistic care, that's even better. But, um, you know, whatever, we've got to just use the tools we currently have and then hopefully educate this new generation of doctors. And I don't know. Yeah, and I wonder also... Start, but... <laughs> Yeah, it's a start, right? This is this is what this is, and this is why yeah. I think. I mean, a hundred people sent me this article, right? Yeah. Everybody knows that I've been sort of advocating around menopause now for a while, and it really yeah. made me laugh that I was like, "You think I haven't seen this article? Yeah. You think I haven't yeah. read this article?" But but you know, one of the things that I was thinking about is that. Again, we think of menopause as this gateway to middle age where there is, there's already a taboo around middle age, right? There's already a stigma that we're invisible or irrelevant. And I wonder if we weren't experiencing the symptoms that we have in menopause, if it would actually make middle age feel much more empowering and exciting. Oh, no doubt. I feel great now. I, I feel empowered and excited. If you'd asked me when I was 48, I could barely get out of bed and I was wondering if I wanted to live till the end of the week. I mean, it was just miserable, um, absolutely miserable. So yes, talk about n disempowered and not excited. I mean, good Lord. I mean, it's just, it can't, now not everybody has that degree of symptoms, but, but it's not uncommon. Uh, right. Very disempowering. And then, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm someone with more resources than anybody in the world. And it was still really hard for me. And it, interesting, like I did, I also, you would, sounds crazy in retrospect, but when I was 47, I didn't know that my symptoms were menopause. I wasn't expecting that. I thought I would be 50 or 51. All of a sudden I was having these symptoms and it took me a few months as a specialist to, mm. to figure out that this was a hormonal situation. So it's not uh, reasonable to assume that your average person is going to know these things. I mean, they're... Uh, uh, because we're not taught, yeah. right? And so it's it's really, um, I mean, I think this kind of conversation is so important because it, no matter how educated we are, I, I don't think anybody, well, let's just say many of us are blindsided by this when it happens. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I like, was. Me too. I was, I, maybe I was the only person that wasn't going to happen to. I don't know. I just hadn't really spent any time thinking about it. And neither had I, I thought it happened to you when you got to, right. I, you know, for, I mean, I had no idea and no frame of reference for it. I, and I'm also curious, also, which doctors do you think, you know, cause somebody was saying, are you an endocrinologist, which you are not, but do, what do you recommend? Do you recommend going to your gynecologist for, for menopausal treatment, your endocrinologist, a uh, GP, is there, uh, you know, an, an order in which you would say there's a priority of which you should see see first? Well, it's very, it's very uh, person dependent. So um, there are physicians amongst each of those specialties and others like urology who are incredibly well educated about menopause because they made a commitment to do that outside of their own medical education. So I knew absolutely nothing. Um, no, nothing that I practice now, I learned in medical school or residency. It was all learned afterwards through my own desire to know everything about menopause. And so you might find doctors in any specialty who've made that commitment. Now your average gynecologist isn't gonna know anything, nor is your endocrinologist or your family practitioner. So you just gotta find the right person. And if you looked at the NAMS website, for example, you'll see physicians in all of those specialties who who've had some kind of a calling to become more educated in this particular field because they sure as heck didn't get it in their regular training. Yeah. It was the ah. after the fact decision. So there was so, some, something drew them to be interested in it. And often it's a woman going through it herself. Sure. Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, one of the things that I did for myself after recognizing that I was in fact in menopause was finding a new gynecologist who was not an OBGYN, but yeah. who specialized in menopause because I felt like I don't want to wait around while you're delivering a baby. Good for you. That's a wonderful right. job, but that doesn't really help me. And it doesn't mean that you would know um, as much about menopause as you would about 
uh, natal care, right? And maternal care. Absolutely. So these are, these are separate specialties in a way. And just to lump them in with gynecology, the, you know, this is, this is not a great, um, it's, it's not great information for us. Oh, I agree. I, I, I was busy for years. I delivered babies and did hysterectomies and all of these wonderful things that we do. I didn't have time to talk about this and nor was I particularly interested. And mm. I was, my, my mind was elsewhere. I'd be talking to you and thinking about the lady in labor at the hospital. I mean, it's a totally different uh, time of life. So, you know, I, I agree. If you have the opportunity to find someone who's no longer focused on that beautiful state, Age of life, taking care of pregnancy and other things that might be helpful. Because I find somebody who knows about this beautiful stage that's of right. life. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. And I mean, this is the other thing I keep thinking. If we were really um, empowered to understand this, this would make this whole age feel like a completely different thing. And you know, again, this is this is one of the things I think that you and I are doing as Gen Xers. It's one of the things that I actually truly believe is our legacy: is to make middle age more exciting and more empowering by really taking menopause by the horns and like wrestling it to the <laughs> ground. You know what I mean? Um, which brings me to our retreat, which we, yeah. you know, guys, I've been so excited to tell you about this. So Dr. Susan really came up with this incredible idea and brought a bunch of great women together to lead this, um, to talk about midlife and not just menopause, but all of the situational um, adjacencies that happen at this time of life, right? I mean, this is a very interesting moment in time. We are healthier and wealthier than any generation at this age before us. And that means we're gonna live a lot longer. So what are we gonna do with all of this time if we're gonna live to be 90 or 100? Right. We have to start looking at middle age as something else. So Dr. Susan, tell us a little bit about the retreat. Oh, it's so exciting. So uh, Stacy's going to be there, by the way. So I am. If all of your amazing followers want to meet this fantastic lady in person, you'll have a chance to do that as well as me. And then uh, we actually have seven hostesses total. And um, if many of these ladies are very uh, locally famous, but all, in Houston or in Texas, but all very uh, well known and specialized in their various ways of looking at menopause. So you've got me as a physician, Stacy with her amazing talents and all the fantastic things that she brings to the midlife experience. We've got a conscious life coach who specializes in midlife transition, a yoga and meditation instructor who's, who specializes in women's midlife magical things. Um, we have a, Elaine Turner, who is a former very famous uh, designer who now has moved into the space of women's wellness coaching, having gone through a lot of tragedy in her life. Uh, fitness uh, and nutrition way. expert. I mean, just, just an amazing group of women. So we're meeting um, in Austin at Miraval. Mm -hmm. And those of you know Miraval, it's, if you just came to Miraval and sat and did nothing, that would be a wonderful weekend. But spending it with 30 women of our age group in general. So, so far, the, the uh, guests who are coming are from 45 to 70. You know, so awesome. probably average age of 55, something in that group. Um, I still believe in some magic around women's health that we're meeting on a full moon night and we're going to do a <laughs> women's circle outside, a lot of witchy stuff. Wait, I just, just got to say, Dr. Susan, last full moon, this Leo moon, I don't know what happened to me. I was yeah. like batshit crazy. So it's, I am, I warn you now, I get weird on full moon. Yeah, we uh, do. And so anybody we, who comes to the retreat, you better know that now. It, it you, is weird. But, yeah, but 30 women also, outside by, and the full moon, all kinds of magic happens. And then on Saturday and Sunday, so this is May 5th through the 8th in mm -hmm. Austin. So Friday night, we're meeting to do our witchy ceremonial things. Um, just getting to know each other, really don't be scared. We're no real witches. And then Saturday, Saturday <laughs> Speak and Sunday. Speak for yourself, Dr. Right, Susan. Maybe. Maybe, maybe a little bit magic. Um, Saturday and Sunday, lots of time for spa, relaxation, just enjoying the fantastic things that Miraval has to offer. And then we have a, a or program, so to speak. This is not a conference where there's slides or anything. Our program is 10 people sitting on yoga mats on the grass, talking to one of our amazing speakers whom you could choose which you wanted to meet with. And we'll be offering our insights about midlife in a conversational kind of a manner. Wonderful evening programs, lots of great food, lovely wine, ending about noon on Monday. Uh, so it's really gonna be fantastic and I cannot wait. Um, we have a few spots left. I know, um, and oh, I know. I hope that some of my friends and followers will join us because I really do believe this is um, the future. Yeah. These kinds of conversations and this article like just opened up such a huge, 
uh, topic that needs to be broken open and really needs to be understood. And I think that once we get our heads around menopause a little bit, once we understand how we can manage it and how we can be empowered through it, then we can really start to look at this age as something, I, I keep talking about it as being post-egoic. You know, mm. it's about adventure. This okay. is about learning everything that you have learned, taking everything that you've learned up until now and living into it in this beautiful way because you have a lot of years in front of you, people. Right. We gotta make the most of them. Yeah, so I agree with all. And just the last little plug, not so much for the, this retreat, although this is an opportunity, any opportunity that we have to get together with other women in our age group, just to share our stories in a safe space. It's truly magical. I've been to several of these events as a guest and it really do leave transformed with this deep understanding that I'm not alone. These are things that other women share. You know, you, we're really sisters at the end of these kind of things, just for being so vulnerable and close with each other. You're talking in groups of 10 people and little cozy groups, no PowerPoint slides or anything. We're not, it's, it's not a conference. It's a cozy. I wouldn't know how to do a PowerPoint. I wouldn't know how to do a PowerPoint presentation. It, if you if you ask me to do one, so thank we're God we're talking about doing what that. what matters, our struggles, our joys, our everything, and just just getting together with other women is priceless. It's uh, it's also very expensive, but it really is priceless because it's transformative, and you'll come home with skills, ideas, joy, friends, um, a new outlook on the second half of life that's more positive perhaps than it is now, or just re-inspired if you're already feeling fantastic yeah. about it. I, amen to that. Now, I just want to end because we have uh, some questions that I want to make sure that we mm -hmm. get to. How long do I need to do HRT once I start? Well, I'm, I'm going to be on mine forever. You know, they say in Texas, they're going to pry it out of my dead hands. That's how I feel about my hormones. I'll be okay. wearing mine when I go in the ground. Okay. And then Somebody else asked, what if you didn't do well on birth control pills in your 20s? Does that mean that you'll still be sensitive to hormones in menopause? Very unlikely. Uh, so birth control pills, much higher dose, different drugs, a synthetic uh, type of estrogen and synthetic progestin in a much higher dose. So bioidentical hormones, very, very unlikely that you'll have any side effects. You've had them in your body your whole life. These are hormones you've made since you were 12. 12? Oh, my God. Or, or 11. That, that or feels like so that long was, ago. Right? Yeah, I think I was 10. Yeah. yeah, but you've had them for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Dr. Susan, thank you so much. This was so informative and so helpful, and I'm so excited to continue this conversation. Again, guys, Dr. Susan's bio, go to that right now. That is where the link for the retreat is, and I hope to see all of you there. Well, I don't know if we can have all of you there, but as many of you as possible. And this is just the first of many. I think this is like, you know, a great thing that we can start doing. You don't even need to go to a spa to do it. Get together with your friends. Start right. talking about this stuff. Yeah. Start advocating for yourself. Have a one Make sure you're seeing the right backyard. Doctors. Yeah, I, I did that for a while. Just have your friends over and sit around the fire in your backyard if you can't come to Austin. And I do want to mention anybody who mentions that they heard about the retreat from this, just uh, when you send a message to the Michelle um, $500 discount um, because we really want you to come. Aww. So just let her know and we'll, we'll add that on. We're really doing this as a labor of love. Um, just, we just want to share the love with everybody. Amen to that. And looking forward to so many more conversations. Guys, thank you all so much. I will put the um, link to the article in this chat and um, talk to you real soon. I know it's been a long time since I did social, but this was a damn good way to come back. And I, I figured out how to do it too. And I will answer as many questions as I can when I see them. I might have to get someone to tell me how, but I <laughs> will figure it out. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Thank you, Thank you Dr. For having Susan. me. It was so nice to see everybody. Good night, guys.